Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 474. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on the Evergreen Network, please visit evergreenpodcasts.com. So this week's interview is with John Perkis. John's the author of three books, including the tremendously bestseller, The Power of Letting Go, How to Drop Everything That's Holding You Back. With an accomplished background, the highest credentials, and working now as a partner at August Leadership, a global executive search firm, John is also known as Banahasta, which is short for Sri Nitya Banahastanada, given to him by his Buddhist guru, HDH Swamiji. In this chat with John, we discuss his remarkable journey to become Banahasta, consciousness, oneness, intuition, and meditation, how he manages his personal and professional missions, and the inherent power of actually letting go. You'll find all the show notes on mintodile.com, and please do take a second to drop in your rating and review, and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show with Banahasta. Banahasta, what a great pleasure it is to have you on my show. You are the best-selling author of this incredible book, The Power of Letting Go. You're also a quote-unquote headhunter. Um, and I would love for you in your own words to describe yourself. Oh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, well, the um, I think the... The straightforward answer, which may surprise some people, is, is I'm, I'm supreme consciousness and so are you. Uh, the Sanskrit word is Paramashiva. And the, so we, you know, we have brains and bodies and all that, but that's all temporary. What's really going on is we are consciousness. And anyone who's experienced deep meditation of any sort will have experienced the consciousness part. You know, when there are no thoughts, it's just consciousness. What's interesting to me is if you go further down the path, you realize that this consciousness is, n- is in no way passive. It's creating everything. And that w- that's when it gets really exciting. So in your words, then, consciousness is the emptiness of thoughts? Um, well, there are, there are, yeah. I mean, this is the key. We've got straight into the key issue, right? Uh, so in the West there's a widespread assumption that consciousness is an epiphenomenon. So we have, you know, a brain which has electrical and chemical processes going on and consciousness is produced through that, right? That's kind of the prevalent Western view. The only problem is it doesn't work very well. So there's, you may have heard, there's a thing in philosophy and science called the hard problem, which is no one can figure out how does, how does this lump of fat and it, electrons and all the rest of it, uh, produce consciousness. We don't know, right? So that's the Western view. And so um, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, you might remember the man with the white beard who taught the Beatles how to meditate. He said, who studied physics before he became a monk. He said um, that the West treats matter as primary and consciousness, if I remember correctly, he said consciousness is an epiphenomenon. It's a kind of a side effect of all this matter, right? So, so Western view of the world is very materialistic, whereas what the Vedic tradition, which, which he came from, um, you know, which is goes back ten thousand years and has led to Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, etc. The Vedic tradition says the opposite, which is consciousness is primary and, and matter is secondary or is an epiphenomenon. So, so. And it's interesting, a lot of Westerners, you know, they, we've been brought up in this materialistic world, worldview, right? But then when you start to meditate, you realize, oh, hold it, some of this doesn't fit. So, for example, you can sit there and meditate and suddenly, uh, I mean, I do transcendental meditation, but I know people who've done mindfulness or Zen seriously. You know, there are times when there are, you're conscious, but there are no thoughts, right? Which is really challenging because, okay, so there are no thoughts, but, and, that, and that consciousness is timeless and, and doesn't change. So a lot of people, they get to that stage and they, you know, they do a bit of Buddhism or something. They think, oh, and they kind of assume that it's passive, this consciousness, right? But then if you go further down the track, 
which I started, you know, I met my guru coming up to eight years ago. And then I went to beyond just meditating. And then you suddenly realize this consciousness is basically running the show <laughs> and it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and, and then once you tune into it, then things start to happen in a way that appears magical. Is it if fair you, to say you, that you could, in, is it sorry, fair to say in that moment, there's some form of oneness? Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, well, oneness is one word. I mean, the, the Sanskrit word is Advaita, which means not to, or non-duality. So sometimes it gets translated as not non-duality or, yeah, oneness. Uh, the only criticism of the word oneness is it, it implies two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like English. Sanskrit is much better at this than English is. You know, it's a bit like Eskimos and snow. You know. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, one, let's call it oneness for the moment is... Um, the Western traditions, and I would include, so the Abrahamic religions, um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, I mean, there are mystical elements to it, but a lot of, there's a strong element of duality, which is God, you know, you, you're separate from me, and we're both separate from God, right, everything's separate, right, whereas the Eastern tradition is based on oneness, which is, there's no separation, and, and obviously, this leads completely different implications in behavior, and but interestingly, physics, if you look at, I'm, I'm very interested in physics. F physics, I would say, is much closer to the Eastern view now. You know, when you look at quantum mechanics and all those things, it's, got, it's become, for the last hundred years, it's gone much closer to the Eastern view than the Western materialistic view. Well, I, I, my reading as a lay person with no, any, any, any <laughs> physical uh, physics uh, training would tend to believe that physics somehow is the investigation of matter, but since matter has become so small, infinitesimally and unpredictably theoretical is, as it is in quantum mm. physics, or at least at, at some level, because we, we're, we're trying to prove things we can't observe mm. in today, it feels like that's, that's where it is and that's why it's closer to the Eastern philosophy? Y yes, and, and that... Well, I mean, I've, one way to look at it is, I, I, I mean, I'm not a physicist, but I've had so many experiences that don't fit with Newtonian physics. They, they just don't, right? So I have lots of friends who are medical doctors or engineers or whatever, and, and, and you know, what they do work well. Most of it works, not all of it. Uh, but um, they if you drill down, you know, it, it works based on Newtonian assumptions, right? But if you go, for example, business, you know, if you try and do business or relationships based on Newtonian assumptions, like, good luck. <laughs> mm. You know, if I push object A towards object B, then the following will happen. No, <laughs> not, in, not in sales, not in negotiations, not in personal relationships, no. Doesn't welcome work. chaos, we have to welcome yeah. chaos. Yeah, yes, but but uh, but also it's interesting. But the chaos is extremely intelligent. Naturally, I'm not, I'm not, not suggesting. Not. I wasn't suggesting for a moment it was. Yeah, not. Yeah, I know. I know. I know you're not. But one thing that I love, um, uh, people sometimes say to me, "Oh, that happened. It was just coincidence." And I said, "Yeah, that was coincidence, which does not mean that it's random. It was an extremely helpful coincidence." And what I've noticed is as you know, going along the spiritual path is there are more and more and more and more helpful coincidences. And in my mid twenties, when I was clinically depressed, there were no no helpful coincidences. So you can kind of observe like that the, you could almost say the, the frequency of, of helpful coincidences is, seems to be correlated with your, if you like, spiritual state. Your awareness. Yeah. Awareness is part of it. So, so I, I have a friend who teaches this and he he talks about a hundred story building. So the hundredth floor is enlightenment and the ground floor is where most of us are, you know, and there are like flies and hedges and you can't see very far. And, <laughs> and I said to him, that's fine. Yeah. And, and suicidal depression, depression is the basement. <laughs> like I've, I've been there. I don't recommend it. There is no light. Yeah. It's dreadful. Yeah, exactly. But, um, uh, but there are things that you can do. To, to move up a few stories and as you go up a few stories you can well you can see a lot further and different things happen right so that's one way of looking so 
people listening to this might be wondering what on earth is the relationship with all of this yes. enlightenment, a hundred stories, consciousness yeah. and business, uh, because oh. you surely are a business person. Has everything to do with business. Yeah, absolutely. Everything to do with business and very practical. So uh, the earliest example I can give, here's a very practical example. So uh, when I, uh, just to give the backstory. So, I went to Cambridge, I worked in banking, I worked in management consulting, I went to INSEAD, they gave me Which, first which by the way, I, I, I went to a banking after university, then yes. I went to INSEAD. So yeah. I kind of, I get the, I get there's a little journey going on. Yeah, yeah, and then we're kind of that, you know, the banking consulting MBA generation. Yeah. And then the, the first big clack, as they say, was- In French. Uh, exactly, the first big clack was, I didn't know there was a first prize, but they gave me this first prize. And so on paper, everything looked perfect. And then within three months, I had I was suicidally depressed. So I was working for Europe's biggest fund management firm in what was supposed to be the perfect job. And I was crying in the toilets, you know, and I was suicidal. I went to see three different doctors and they all came out with the same diagnosis, right? So the relevance of that to business <laughs> is that a lot of people in business are trying to do business through logic. And so at the age of 26, I was extremely well drilled in logic. And um, I meet people in their 50s, 60s even, who are still functioning from logic or trying to, because that's the way we've been conditioned, right? And what I would say is there comes a point in most people's lives when logic doesn't work anymore and you have to go beyond the mind. Well, hopefully you go beyond the mind to something much bigger and more powerful. And you could call it, you could call it intuition. And um, some people are very disparaging about intuition. The, the definition I would use is immediate insight without reasoning. Um, so Microsoft produced this, the Microsoft World English Dictionary called it immediate insight without reasoning, which for me is the best definition. So you have an idea or you have a solution and it comes in a flash. It's not a step-by-step -step reasoning process. Um, and what I realized when I was 26 was I had all this logical training and my intuition had pretty much died. And looking back, the reason I became depressed was the the jobs I was most interested in were fund management and headhunting. So my roommate from Cambridge was a headhunter by that stage, and I was interested in investment. And I realized to my horror that both of them required huge amounts of, of intuition. <laughs> like you can't be a headhunter without intuition, you'll go crazy. And, and I, I know quite a lot of really good fund managers and they've all got a dose of intuition. I mean, they do their analysis, right? But you can't do fund management like a robot. <laughs> well funnily enough I, I i certainly would subscribe more to robotic fund management uh than robotic headhunting mm. in that the use of of computers in fund management and, and all things yeah. mathematical uh, seems far more congruent than yeah. dealing with human beings and trying to figure out whether someone's a fit for a certain culture yeah i mean that's a great top that's a great topic i mean in in um yeah in fund management there has been some progress with that with algorithms um yeah there has been some uh um, unfortunately you know when the market changes sometimes the al you know the algorithm stops working well back to your newtonian logic story yeah uh, the, the, that, the, the rules that are sometimes good but they always screw up somewhere they and screw that's up the nature of it or you get a crowded trade because everyone's doing it um but the the other thing i mean i laugh about it i mean it's <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but um, people have tried to apply artificial intelligence to recruiting. Have you heard about this? What, one well, of the, sure. The HR tech is using it for screening a lot, of course. Yeah, but, but one of the big problems is the AI quickly learns to be racist. You know, it looks at who was, you know, who became a successful XYZ CEO, whatever in that past. Oh, well, they were white men, six feet tall. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, I mean, whether it's AI, I mean, this is how headhunters, and actually, this is the briefs that so many companies give. I, I worked in a large organization. Yeah. And when we were trying to hire somebody externally, which we didn't like to do because we wanted to be internal, but we would say, well, make sure they've had lots of experience in our industry before and are successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hence yeah. the bias. 
Oh yeah, well, that's one bias. I mean, there's so many biases, but but for me, it's fascinating that you know that artificial intelligence very quickly learns to be biased, and then and then the question is, how do you stop that happening? Hmm. You know. Um, anyway, so in terms of you know back to our conversation about business, the most successful business people I run into um, who are not enlightened, and let's assume then I I don't I'm not aware that I've met an enlightened business person yet. Maybe I have. But the, the ones who are not enlightened, they do, they all have a combination of analysis and intuition. And if you look at, you know, some of the superstars like, you know, Steve Jobs, I mean, he did Zen meditation for a very long time. He also took a lot of psychedelics. Yeah, he did all kinds of things. And then there's Ray Dalio, who runs the world's biggest hedge fund, Bridgewater. So he's a poster child for um, transcendental meditation. So there are a lot of um superstars in business and the arts and many many fields who meditate and you know one of the obvious um effects of doing meditation properly is your intuition becomes super strong um and i and i would even say actually in mathematics you know mathematics looks like a logical process but to my mind there are there are leaps you know, I don't know if you read this, about a really famous physicist, I think it was Einstein and maybe Paul Dirac, they used to imagine sitting on the end of a beam of light. And, and then they did the maths afterwards. Um, so um, th these big leaps aren't, I mean, they do happen in the sciences. Uh, are you familiar with um, Srinivas Ramun Ramanujan, the famous mathematician? No, 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 way uh, out of my scope. <laughs> No, I, know, may, I know maths is philosophy, of course. No, he's got he's got a difficult, he's got a long name. Uh, but anyway, what's interesting about him, there was a film made about him with Jeremy Irons and is it Dev Patel? And what was fascinating is that he was basically an untrained mathematician who turned up in Cambridge. Um, Jeremy Irons plays the um the character who discovers him. Anyway, he basically did puja, so he did a Hindu little Hindu ceremony, which I do. And then he downloaded mathematical theorems, as, as I understand it, with no proofs. And they're still, and, and, and he just downloaded enormous numbers of them, and they're still figuring out a lot of this. But he's an example, to my mind, of an, you know, an extreme case of you know, a hard science progressing quickly due to pure intuition, pure download. I've always thought, uh, Van Hastan, that genius is a combination of knowledge and intuition because yeah. it's generally as far my experience has been that it's hard to uh come along and just have intuition just like this guy has had generally yeah. speaking what you need to have is some knowledge of the framework for example a language you need yeah. to have some way to express it yeah, to yeah. wonders to learn into it yeah, because and you know, unless it's a three-year-old who's downloading this stuff, yeah, there's been a there's been somewhere something has happened before, connecting of dots, allowing yeah. of things to happen to come into you. So if you're a genius in wine, you you, you kind of need to know a little bit about grapes. Uh, there's yeah. a place called Bordeaux, mm -hmm. and then and then the rest I feel is being in touch with yourself. In yeah. order to assess the wine, not because it's priced by this or be given a, a rating by him or her, yeah. but you have you have a an appreciation of it as it goes down into your body in a really carnal way, and I feel that's more the intuition side. Yeah, I, I think most of us it's both. I mean, for example, in headhunting or executive search, so I I started recruiting CFOs or finance directors 25 years ago. I've met a lot of these people. I mean, I recruit other people now, but so I would say in my case, there's a combination of intuition for me is a combination of a sort of an insight out of the blue and pattern recognition. There still is pattern recognition, right? In my case, right. Because I've met thousands of these people. Um, However, if you go to the end of the, I mean, you know, uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book, um, which one is it, where he talks about it takes 10,000 hours to learn anything. Well, I did the sums on Mozart. Tipping Mo point. Uh, uh, is it that one? The, um, if you run the numbers on Mozart, Mozart didn't have time. <laughs> <laughs> he just started downloading, right? He didn't have time to clock up 10,000 hours. Um, and if I look at, um, so Swamiji, 
who so Sri Nityananda Paramashivam, who I followed for nearly eight years. So he is an enlightened master. He's a he's what's called an avatar, you know, someone who comes down to help the rest of us. And if you look at him, I've spent quite a lot of time with him. And also he has a school, he has a guru call where the children are brought up within that tradition. And and they, he and they download things with no prior knowledge. You know, there's but but you know, that's that's living enlightenment. You know, and I think I suppose most of us are somewhere in the middle, probably. Oh, probably in the lower floors, I'm thinking most of us. So you have uh, you had a, a good run at Hydric and Struggles, and mm-hmm. now you're working at August Leadership. And what I'd love to talk about with you is is the the evolution of headhunting. Uh, yes. And and where we are today, because from my angle, of course, I, I'm I've been independent for 10 years, so I've been out of the game. Mm-mm. But I still feel that the the business of headhunting continues to look at fill them with competencies, get somebody with past experience, use mm-hmm. HR tech for automation as much as possible to make it as efficient as possible. And you get paid for the hire and very few get paid for the endurance component mm-hmm. of it, fit and culture and all the rest mm-hmm. in terms of real rewards. So that's my sort of intro into WTF. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a great question or a great intro. Um, yeah, I think um, executive search has been very slow to innovate. I would think only law has been slower amongst the occupations I can think of. <laughs> politicians. I thought politicians. Were, yeah, were another one. Slow, yeah. law, law, politicians, then executive search. Um, the pandemic has forced executive search to innovate. Because we couldn't, you know, before the pandemic, headhunters would sit around in Mayfair or the equivalent in other cities and and drink coffee with people. And everybody kind of went around to see people. And then searches were conducted um, in, a, in a quite a lengthy way. And you're right, people got paid for uh, completing the search. And... Um, Yeah, so that didn't change for a very long time. I think the changes that are observable, one is uh, with the advent of LinkedIn, for example, quite a lot of big companies are doing their own mid-level recruitment. So when I joined Hydrogen Struggles 25 years ago, you know, we cut our teeth. We did two or three mid-level searches. And I was very fortunate because after a year, the chairman said, I want you to set up and run the CFO practice. So I was doing board level searches when I was 36. but most people did a lot of mid-level searches. Well, I think LinkedIn and Facebook, a lot of these outfits, they've they've taken out the mid-market because big search firms can do that for themselves, right? Um, so in a way, we're going back to basics, which is you have recruitment firms who recruit people in their 20s. Low end. And then you have search firms. A lot of the mid-market, I think, is gone. Um, but it's very interesting what you say about the the long term. I mean, August Leadership, one of the reasons I've joined is that they've, they've stripped out a lot of the things you don't need. So, you know, as we've both done our MBAs, if you think about the value chain in executive search, it struck me a long time ago that there are a whole load of items in the value chain that the client doesn't value. Hmm. They don't care, right? So one thing I really like about August Leadership um, is that we've we've chopped out various things that the candidate that the client doesn't care about so we can just focus on what the client does care about so we have a global platform uh we we have one profit center we have no silos we so for example if i win an assignment or i'm trying to win an assignment and i think my colleague in what happened my colleague in abu dhabi is going to be perfect for this then i call up my colleague in abu dhabi and we work on it together right so whereas in a in a conventional search firm well, you, 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 I think the American metaphor is stay in your lane. You Each to, to their own. Yeah, well, you have to stay in your silo, which is you, you're put in a particular silo and you have to stay there. Well, as you become more experienced in executive search, that doesn't work very well, especially if you've been to INSEAD, for example. So my, my network is INSEAD, Cambridge, and former clients and camera candidates. Those people are spread all over every sector. So it's pointless putting me in a silo because you cut off 90% of my business, right? So I'm much happier in an environment where I can I can choose who I work with and and just be very flexible, and and it's all and it's run very efficiently online. And also having we have research teams in 
um, in Pakistan, Mexico, and soon Turkey, which means it's a bit like the invest investment bank's been doing that for years. You can pass things around the globe at night while you're sleeping. So you can say, look, can you please work on that? And next morning it's there, right? So I think technology, and, and what really made everyone speed up was the fact that you basically, if you didn't, there's a whole generation of people who probably would have retired without using Zoom, you know, and, and suddenly they had to go online. And that includes a whole load of board members, right? They had to go online. And, and we had to. So. I'm Anne-Marie Kelly. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize-winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. You are somebody who has a personal purpose, and I would love for you to describe your journey where you are in this role towards enlightenment, and then we're going to then afterwards circle back into how that relates to the job search. Uh, what, to job search, as in, as in headhunting? Or? So yes, but right now, so start with your journey yeah, okay, to becoming... Yeah. Uh, Sri Nitya Banahastanada Nanda. Don't know how to say that correctly. Um, and, and where you are, what, what floor are you on? And oh, okay. uh, how, how do you live in that space? Um, well, I can, I can give, I can just, I can describe the journey briefly in, in, with the aim of helping people who are listening to this. So for me, the first big breakthrough was I learned to meditate ostensibly by accident, which I described in The Power of Letting Go. So I got totally stuck. I was living in Paris. I was reading this novel in which the, the character was taught. It was called A Rich Man's Secret. The, the, the protagonist was told by this man he met to return to now. So I, I kept returning to now. And every time I felt stressed, I returned to now. And, and then I, because my work wasn't getting him, I stopped working and I just surrendered and asked to be guided. And a short while afterwards, an advert appeared in the newspaper from Hydrogen Struggles. And long story short, I got the perfect job. And it was my first experience of how everything falls into place if you surrender. I mean, there, there were five, I don't know if you remember from the book, there were five criteria for the perfect candidate. And I was the perfect candidate. And so it, essentially, when I let go, the cosmos moved me seamlessly from A to B. You know, I dropped my ego. Yeah, that's the big piece. I suppose, you know, when you move into that place, you're living more the Eckhart Tolle yeah. moment of now. You're in the present. And when you read a piece, you are you latch onto it because you're there with it at that time. You're not glossing over it. You're not worried about what it means about maybe yeah. my image or, or yeah. other things related to the ego. All of a sudden, poof, you, see, yeah, exactly. you see the connection. Yeah, one aspect of it is is everything suddenly can like the way I describe it is my my intuition switched on like a searchlight. I could suddenly read other people, and I could read myself to some degree. Um, by the way, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now, was published the following year, so mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. And when his book came out, I got a better idea about what I was doing. Oh, mm -hmm. by the way, Buddhists have been doing this for you know two and a half thousand years. Oh, great! <laughs> so that was the first one. The second one was an American friend a few years later suggested I learn transcendental meditation, which I did. And that was amazing because I suddenly, I mean, I've just done it prior to this podcast. Um, I suddenly began to experience pure consciousness twice a day. So despite all the chaos in my life, because by this time I'd left hydrogen struggles, I was trying to run my own headhunting business. But twice a day, I had this time when there was just consciousness and frequently no thoughts. And what I noticed is, you know, things like, well, for a start, my jet lag fell by, I, I get almost no jet lag. I do TM on the plane, right? And, um, and animals started walking up to me in the street, like cats and dogs. So there was quite a lot of change happened. Um, um, and then the, and that's, so that's the second one. And the third one uh, in this journey was, um, I realized that there are so many people who meditate who then have stressful lives the rest of the time. <laughs> uh, and then I also realized 
because I meet them, you know, there are, there are very wealthy people who have, who have perpetual permanent tragedies with their children or they have health problems or cancer or they keep getting divorced. So if you look at every human being who's not enlightened, they have patterns in the area of health, wealth, relationships and career. If you take those four areas, everybody's blocked in one of those four areas. And and I, I got stuck yet again and I meditated and asked to be guided and I switched on Facebook and a friend invited me to this event. Well, I'd met her three times. She invited me to this event. And when I got there, the, we call him Swamiji, has a long name. He was on this screen with a terrible internet connection. And he'd written this book called Living Enlightenment. I suddenly realized, oh, what he's doing, he's showing that, that bliss that I experienced during meditation. He's showing us how to live like that all the time. And then I just, I, like I read half of the book and said, right, I'm, I went to India for three weeks and uh, to follow one of his programs. And, and then, and then I, well, actually went, he was teaching this technique called completion, which is how you remove all your pain patterns. So you can, you can manifest or create whatever you want. So I went to learn that. And then I came away with the impression, oh, he's a great teacher. He happens to be a Hindu. He's a great teacher. I went back the following year and you know, there were children reading while wearing blindfolds and he was healing people on an industrial scale and all these things are happening. And I just realized, well, I appear to be on a kind of fast track to enlightenment. You know, he's not just a great teacher. <laughs> There's something major going on here and that and it's carried on. So, yeah. So I suppose they, to answer your question, three big jumps. Mm. And, and it seems on an accelerating program yes. right now. <laughs> yes. Accelerated. So, so um, for someone who's not in, in this project or, or this idea of life as, as enlightenment, what are the arguments that work best? Do you feel like you need to proselytize about that or do you just sort of observe it? What, how do you sit with that? Well, the way I, the way I see it is it, I've always been like this. I think if I find something that works, I tell everybody, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a bit like, if if uh, blueberries are on special in Waitrose, <laughs> tell my neighbor, whatever. Um, yeah, I just, if something works for me, I mean, like for example, when I learned Transcendental Meditation, I, I said to people, Look, you know, this is cheaper than a plane ticket. It's worth it just to reduce your jet lag. <laughs> you know, this is brilliant. That's for sure. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, and I, do, I don't proselytize. I tell, I tell people, I mean, here's a practical example. Um, I mean, I haven't I haven't had coffee with chief executives or finance director very much for, for the last two years. But before the pandemic, uh, you know, someone would say, I want to have coffee with you and talk about my career. So chief executive or a CFO comes to see me and, and I say, oh, so I'd say, well, what, what is it you want to do? And they say, well, I want to do this. And, and, and they show me your, the CV. And, and, and then my third question would be, do you meditate? Right. And the reason for asking that question is, I would say there are there are two ways to to run your life, including business. Right? One is the um, is the how should we call it the logical way based on Western cultural conditioning, which I have been through and I never want to go back to. Hmm. Uh, and give to give a practical example: if you want to win new business, according to that theory. It's a, it's a probabilistic exercise. So you need to knock on a certain number of doors and cer a certain number of people will open the door. A, a, another subset will be friendly to you and another subset might give you a, an assignment, right? Exhausting. <laughs> but that's what the logic dictates. And you can improve the odds in certain ways, but okay. I would much prefer to do what I'm doing now, which is um, accept the principle that I am Paramashiva, I am supreme consciousness, and so are you. And, and then, so my task is to be in, totally clear about what I want to manifest. For example, I want, might want to manifest a, an assignment or something, um, or an amount of money or whatever it is. And then the really important task is to remove everything that's blocking that. And that's what chapter three of The Power of Letting Go is about. And, and the reason is, if you think about it, those people who are blocked in some areas, but not others, and you look at your, our own lives, some things we manifest very easily, right? Like some people manifest money easily. Some people stay healthy easily. Some people have relationships easily, right? But they're blocked in other areas. And if you drill down and see why, and I've done this with so many people, 
is there's something something very painful happens between the ages of two and seven. So Freud said pretty much the same thing, right? The, the problem was I did Freudian psychoanalysis and we, we described all the problems and didn't solve any of them, right? And the reason I latched onto Swamiji very quickly was I realized he has a technique for removing those pain patterns. And it takes effort, but when you remove those pain patterns, otherwise known as samskaras or karma or whatever you want to call it, when you remove those pain patterns, suddenly you start manifesting what you want. And so my message to anybody listening to this is, if you want to have a great life, look at this, look at this very carefully, because you'll be amazed what you can manifest once you, once you take the brakes off. So I have a, a feeling like I, I need to, of the four pain points that you were talking about or blockages, mm. finances seems to be the odd one out. It's, okay. it's money. We all need money, but how much do we need? And so someone says, well, I need money to have my sixth house, exactly, the, yes. the latest Maserati. So yes. I'm going to manifest my Maserati. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Doesn't feel like it's the, uh, the greatest objective. Yes. Well, okay. So there are, there's, there's a filter you can apply to that, right? Which, which will help. So the, the, the way to filter it is to say, okay, is it a borrowed desire? So a borrowed desire is I want a Maserati because my brother or my best friend wants a Maserati. You know, it's, it's not a true desire for you. It's just something you picked up, right? And, and, and you're probably going to find it very hard to manifest. Uh, Swamiji talks about that. He, an exercise he used to do was get people to write down all their desires on a sheet of paper, you know, loads, and then meditate. And then afterwards, write down the desires. And he said, what happened frequently? He said it was like shaking leaves on a tree. It's the, only the true desires, the golden leaves were left on the tree, right? All the other stuff fell off. <laughs> so one thing is borrowed desires. And the second one, and you have to be really careful about this, is desires which arise from incompletion or pain. And I give, I mean, this is a topic example and a terrible example is let's take Vladimir Putin. So Vladimir Putin wants to be safe, right? And he's afraid. I don't know if you heard about this. Apparently before the invasion, he used to spend time looking at videos of what happened to other dictators like Ceausescu, Saddam Hussein, Gaddafi. Right, so he wants to be safe. A tsar, I believe, also. <laughs> Sorry? There's a tsar. A tsar, because, yeah, there was a I slight think. problem with the Romanovs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So basically, dictators generally come to a very bad end, right? So he's very afraid. And so his desire is to be safe. So this is a major incompletion, right? Like there's a major, major, major pain pattern in the hands of, in the mind of a very powerful man, right? Actually, it's in your body. You can, you can find them in your body, right? So, and this is, it. so what Swamiji says is action out of incompletion leads to more incompletion. So action out of pain leads to more pain, right? So, so he wants to be safe. I know I'll create a buffer state and invade Ukraine. He now has millions more people who want to kill him, right? So that's an example, that's an extreme example of a desire which comes from incompletion leading to more incompletion. And that's why it's so important to remove the incompletions. I mean, that's an extreme case, but we all have it, right? We have desires to do things which are based on pain. And so it's so important to remove those. And then the ones that are based on, for want of a better word, you know, love or inspiration, those, those desires manifest easily and they're for everybody's benefit. So the area I want to get into then is now I'm CEO of a company, or yeah. a brand manager or whatever. Yes. I really, I want to manifest the success of my company yeah. limited. So the share price goes up and I yeah. get paid and that's back to the financial and career side yeah. of things. Yeah. What are the filters that one needs to use in order for the manifestation to come around better? Okay. Well, what I would do is I drill down a bit and say, okay, if I was talking to CEO and I talked to plenty of them, is okay. So what is it you really want? You know, because companies are, are a vehicle, right? So are books, so are podcasts, right? They're just vehicles. What is it you really want? And Isn't life a vehicle? Yes. Yeah. I mean, arguably, it's a, it's a vehicle to become enlightened. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. So then I would ask the CEO, what is it you really want? You know, 
because so many of us we assume you know i need i need a company and a stock price and a blah and a blah and a blah to get what i really want right and so it, it may be that they want something beyond all that and it can be achieved much faster and more easily but it may be you know i genuinely want to have the experience of being a ceo running a successful company and if you apply the completion process to that you'll get there far more easily it will happen so easily i mean i i'm going to jump slightly to the other thing that you raised so what i've done two things i've done recently so when i joined august leadership i said you know i want to do senior level searches i also want to invest in client companies when appropriate so a former colleague of mine recruited Eric Schmidt to be chairman of Google. Uh, and this is public information because um, it's in the annual report. They had to declare it. Hy um, Hydrogen Struggles made $128 million on the warrant, which came with that search, right? Because they recruited for a mixture of cash and a warrant. So I've always been in, you know, I, you know, I knew the guy, I knew the guy who did that search. So I, I've been inspired to do something like that. And, um, and, now it's starting to manifest. So I am doing searches where I take equity in companies, but it's happened. It's happening very easily. Uh, actually, some of them are coming to me. I, I, I know a, a, lawyer, a lawyer friend of mine. I realized he was describing me to people as headhunter and mystic. <laughs> and some of these companies started coming to me. The other thing that happened was, um, I, in fact, I can't remember exactly how it happened, but a friend and I have set up a thing called Enlightened Ventures. So it's it's the the URL is enlightened.ventures, and we're we're not we're not we don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but the basic idea is there are companies which need funding, which are going to do great things for the world, right? The first one I got involved in is is using artificial intelligence um, to, for cognitive behavioral therapy. So you're helping people to see their patterns so they can do something about it, right? But there, there are several more in the pipeline. Uh, so on the one hand, we've got these companies that need funding. On the other hand, we've got, you know, a lot of, a lot of investors. If you take some venture capital firms, but particularly family offices, very wealthy people, they're becoming much more conscious about how they invest. So that's what we're doing. So we're, we don't have the business model crystal clear yet, but it's very clear that there's a need on both sides. Mm. I love that stuff because it's, it's, it's how to change the world in a very conscious way. One of the things I, I love about the the Google uh, way of recruiting was that they have a a kind of filter that I understand. I don't know if it's still there that you have to have been to Burning Man and oh, or really? have <laughs> taken psychedelics. Oh no! And, <laughs> and I think that I, I I find that quite enlightened, frankly. Okay. Because I'm I'm a big f believer in the power of psychedelics. I've been okay. doing that for a long time. Wow. And it's my my tool okay. to get to get to the other side, and I, I've yeah. done it hundreds of times. Okay, and and really, uh, I look at it as as now, a, 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 like a toy ground to go into right, and right. explore the outer regions of my mind and my humanity, my spirituality, and uh, my livingness okay. in this right. big universe. So um, that's one of the fun things. We don't have endless amounts of time, but I, I um there. Well, and yeah, the other comment I was going to make was when you talk about headhunter and mysticism, I was thinking, well, it sounds like you might be a cannibal, um, you know, like a headhunter <laughs> where you, you it's just. You, I haven't thought about that one. It would make for a good uh, Christmas card. Yeah, <laughs> it's just. Yeah. But um, in in my observations of leadership, I, I've written on the topic and I'd like you have had the chance to meet many. Uh, I have somehow connected dots with Indian leadership yeah. and success yeah and i don't have the data but the number of big companies run by indians yeah. I, I, there's got to be a pattern there, there that's is. beyond because when you think of the numbers story well i don't see as many chinese uh ceos of large anyway western companies yeah and and the proportion of Indians at the top seems uh, disproportionate. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, the, what I say about that is uh, point one, one in every six human beings is Indian. <laughs> the start. Having said that, um, we had a shortlist recently where two out of six were Indian. So they definitely are overrepresented. Um, I would say, 
yeah, English is a factor because, you know, Chinese people have not historically grown up learning English. But I think there's more than that. I mean, for quite a long time, I had a sort of private theory that it was Hindus. Well, also, you know, Hindus are the majority in India um, because of the Hindu culture. But The Economist, uh, I can't quote you verbatim, but The Economist ran an article a short while ago. They actually analyzed it by caste. Oh. And if I remember correctly, they were saying it's, it's if I, I just read it quickly, I think they were saying it's Brahmins. And basically there's a difference between the, the successful groups of Indians outside India versus inside India. Um, you know, but you can see that in other cultures as well. There's a difference between the export version and the domestic version, right? Mm -hmm. You're well, right. It, it, so one has to imagine have, Brahmins. It would be right. naturally the most likely leaders. Uh, well, I need to go back and check that article because I, I, I skimmed it. But it's, it's, I mean, if you step back from the whole caste question, um, I think there is something in the Vedic culture which, which strongly uh, predisposes people to success in business because um, leadership is approached in a different way. I mean, Swamiji has spoken and written a lot about leadership. He says it's, he talks about being a state, not a status. And so when people work on themselves, that, that completely changes who they attract and who follows them. I mean, it's a very big subject. I mean, make a fascinating book, right? Maybe you want, well, maybe you want to write it. <laughs> when the power of being yourself makes you a better leader. Yeah. Uh, something I'm familiar with for sure. As a, yeah. that's the, That was basically the title of my last book. Um, but um, in in writing your book, Brand You, I was wondering what reflections Banahasta has of Brand You, which was published in 12, 2012. Oh, yeah. Have you, have you, because in your journey, where are you and how do you look at things where you might have been conflicted as, as yeah, to where you are no, today? I have, I have moved, I have moved on from that. Um, I mean, I don't. Um, and by the way, I mean, Power of Letting Go is selling 20 times as fast as Brandy did. So. Well, uh, hallelujah. I've seen that. I mean, it's absolutely uh, a fantastic bestseller. And, and you know, like uh, what I'm interested in is that journey. Because yeah, I, I, I wrote a book on empathy. Yeah. It was not because I'm empathic, as I needed to be more empathic. <laughs> was was really what I needed to do. Yes. And I look back and I, I, I still struggle with not being up to the standard of what I write about. Yes. So that, that relationship with what you produce and who you are, you're looking yeah. back and, you and how that, you are on the journey. Have you heard that expression, writing is God's way of showing you how sloppy your thinking is? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in terms of Brand You, I mean, we wrote it before the explosion in social media. It was actually written in 2008, I think. Um, I, what I would say is um, I can see personal branding at work. So we talked about talents, talents, values, purpose, and then archetypes. I can see the archetypes at work all the time. I mean, for those listening who aren't familiar, um, Carl Jung codified lots and lots of archetypes, which are ancient. They go back thousands of years. In personal branding, a lot of people now use 12, and I've always used 12, and it's always worked. Um, so, for example, I, I still find personal branding very useful. So, because it's it's something that we see in each other and in ourselves. So for example, the first time I met, first time I came across Swamiji, I just saw the magician archetype in him. It was all about transformation, right? And um, and you can see it in everything. You can see it in, um, like some people strongly evoke the ordinary guy or girl. It's, it's just something, that, and you can see you know, like, well, you know, why is David Beckham so successful? Well, he's kind of the epitome of the ordinary guy, right? even when he doesn't play soccer anymore. So you can see that going on. I suppose where I am now is to say that we can see that going on, but in a sense, we're, we're beyond that. It, it's, it's something that's there. I mean, I really love everything to do with the magician, but I don't feel defined by that. And I suppose there's a danger, the real, the danger of being getting too serious about your personal brand is you're, you're consolidating the ego which needs to be by the way my, my name uh, means um eternally blissful form of shiva who holds the arrows to destroy the ego of oneself and others right so <laughs> the ego has to go if you want to be enlightened and if you get too serious about your personal brand 
that can be a problem. Having said that, I mean, one of the great paradoxes, I mean, who do you, who do you think has the biggest personal brand in human history? Who would you say? Um, Jesus, I don't know. I, yeah, I would say Jesus, right? You know, Jesus. to my knowledge, Jesus didn't write anything. He didn't, he didn't promote himself online. He just, you know, he's like Swamiji. He's an avatar. I would, I'd say he's probably, very, very probably an avatar. You know, and so he he basically came down, did amazing things for lots of people who eventually killed him, uh, and has the greatest personal brand in history. <laughs> so there may be a lesson there for the rest of us. Well, I I suppose the, the lesson I take from that is once you incarnate, embrace your purpose, yeah, others will talk about you. Oh yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. And I think, I mean, I don't think about it very much, but um, actually I did, I had a problem a little while ago with some people in business. They said, you know, cause I'm where I'm where, you know, I wear kum kum as much as I can. And um, I mean, not, not in front of new clients, but I wear as much as I can uh, between my eyes. Anyway, it's very good for the third eye. And someone in business was saying this wasn't good. She didn't do this. And, and they said, he said, but you are completely authentic. And to add another marketing point, it does stand out as a different way of being. So yeah. when when you when you want to be in marketing, oh, he's the guy with the red dot <laughs> yeah. yes. in headhunting. Well, and you know, plus he's written a book and a few other things that I think in in a practical manner, you also verbalize well, you present well. These are other things that go into helping. Yeah, because if you if you started drooling and. <laughs> and and didn't you know articulate well or have a book that was such a bestseller that these are part of your platform as well right yes well thank you yeah so I'm, i feel much more comfortable i mean at first i thought how's this going to work and um but yeah yeah it's working well and um yeah i i'm still in i'm still in trans uh, in transition because yeah, i was brought up in the west so i'm still i'm still on the journey you know well, I, I had uh, someone else on the on my, my show recently, and Michelle Navarez, to name her, she said, well, getting to know yourself takes more than a lifetime. <laughs> and yeah. I, I, I grab onto that, because yeah. God knows, as much as I talk about being yourself and, and embracing your whole, wholeness and, and your foibles, your issues, your imperfections, the fact that I've done lots of drugs... <laughs> I'm out there on that and uh, embracing it as best I can, but uh, it doesn't always work out. So right. John, Banahasta, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Um, well, how can people uh, track you down? I mean, should I type in Banahasta or should uh, I do no, com? No, no, for the time being, well, so the power of letting go, the name on the book is John Perkis. So J-O-H-N-P-U-R-K-I-S-S. So I just have a website called johnperkis.com. And if you click on it, you can choose between executive search and enlightenment. And the books are under enlightenment. Funny that. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you very much, Banahasta. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Minta. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minta Dialogue podcast. If you like the show and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash Minta Dialogue. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on mintodile.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. Arms
of a woman I'm a convinced man challenge my fate I'm a convinced man competitions in me a convinced man in the arms of a woman despite revenges and struggle to see live for the challenge so lives not in What's wrong with challenge? I know soon we all die I like the feel of a stranger Tucked around me Precipitating the danger To feel free Trust in my reason And let me show you why I'm a convinced man Practicing my lines I'm a convinced man Finds a convinced man in the arms of a woman I'm a convinced man bit to the test I'm a convinced man I'm ready for an arrest I'm a convinced man in the arms of a woman Kelly. Wild Precious Life is a podcast about dreaming big, digging in and connecting across distance, division, and loss. In each episode, I talk with prize-winning writers, musicians, and wanderers who remind all of us how we can make the most of the time we have. So meet me here. Let's walk and talk and dream and discover what it means to be wild, precious, and brave. <laughs> 